Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, to check out All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo and its sequel, All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet. In each ebook, I examine the careers and histories of seven great fictional detectives or policemen and life lessons that can be learned from their stories. They are available as ebooks uh, in any fine ebook store uh, and also as audiobooks through audible.com or the iTunes Store. And you can find all my books, audiobooks, and ebooks at store.greatdetectives.net. Now, one thing I do want to discuss here is our, the star of our series, uh, who is Larry Haynes. Haynes was an actor best known for his work on the soap opera Search for Tomorrow. He joined the series two months into its run and stayed there for the rest of 35 years, winning two Daytime Emmy Awards in the process. We've also heard him on the great detectives of old-time radio before, mostly in season five. He starred in the series Manhunt as Andrew Stevens. Manhunt was a 15-minute syndicated radio series where the entire mystery was contained within the 15 minutes. For about 11 minutes of actual story time. And we used to play an episode of Manhunt against a part 5 of a Johnny Dollar serial with parts 1 and 2 and parts 3 and 4 being played on Monday and Wednesday. He was also in Easy Money, one of my very favorite series that we don't have many episodes of and really wish we had more of uh, where he played Mike Trent, a magician who turned a racket buster and exposed con games. And if you've not heard that series, by the way, it is on in on the YouTube channel. And you can also just go to greatdetectives.net and put easy money in the search box. Also, check out archives.greatdetectives.net. He mostly worked out of New York. That's where he did uh, it, probably the bulk of his work. And certainly he was Mike Hammer for the New York run of the series, leaving the series when they decided to move productions to Hollywood. Now let's go ahead and get into today's episode of That Hammer Guy. The original air date, March the 31st of 1953, and this one is called There's Something About a Name. Here's Larry Haynes in the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. Like the song says, there's nothing like a day. And there isn't. You know. You've met all kinds, from the obvious barroom type who'll stop at nothing to sell a drink, to the Park Avenue smoothies who'll stop at nothing to get their Grecian profiles on a society page. Yeah, that's what you know about dames. So naturally, you're suspicious. Do you have to look at me as if I robbed the bank? Those are the first words you hear from this special representative of the weaker sex. Your tried and true secretary's all that is gone for the day, and you're loitering around the office, minding your own bottle of bourbon, when in walks this 105 pounds of platinum-topped curve. You are my camera, aren't you? Well, I'm not the Wizard of Oz. My, my, isn't the man charming? Do you mind if I sit down? If I did... You're uh, interested in business, Mike? Ah, uh, you picked the wrong day. I just got news that I fell heir to seven best Arabian oil Well, so let's talk pleasure, huh? My husband might object. Yeah, maybe he would if you had a husband. You're very observant, Mike. I should have worn my gloves. I'll take you the way you are. Later, perhaps. I would like to talk business first. If you say so. I do. And I also say there's a thousand dollars in my handbag. I also say that thousand is yours, Mike. If you want it. Uh, what you say your name was? I didn't say. Yes. Well, uh, you'd better or we're going to find each other total strangers. There's no reason at all we should be strangers. I like you, Mike. My name is Laura Fenton. Mm -hmm. Well, look, Laura, uh, I get paid to help solve murders, not commit them. Uh, oh, commit murder? What's so funny? You. You have no sense of humor. Well, I do when I've got something to laugh about. Well, I merely offered you the $1,000 to look after a young lady from tonight until Monday morning. Hmm? You still don't want the money? A grant to take care of a young lady? Well, there may be trouble. 
I have reason to believe Jolie's life is in danger. Uh, Jolie? That's her name? Yes, she just arrived from Paris. I want to be absolutely certain no harm comes to her. A thousand's a lot of folding money for just uh, bodyguarding. As I said, there may be trouble. Well, Mike? Uh, this uh, Jolie... <laughs> You're wondering what she looks like. Well, let me just say she's won several beauty contests in France. Uh, man doesn't work for bread alone. Uh, you understand. I'm staying at the Phoenix Mart. If you come around tonight at, um, say, 10 o'clock, I'll see that you and Jolie get acquainted. Well, that suits me. Oh, but uh, I don't speak a word of French. That's all right. Jolie doesn't speak a word of English. Oh, we'll get along fine, then. Your $1,000 has been this envelope. Count it if you like. Uh, yeah, thanks. I will. It's been a pleasure meeting you, Mike. I'll see you at 10. I'll be there. Oh, there's nothing like a dame, but there's nothing like a guy, either. The prospect of protecting a lovely morsel from gay Paris doesn't exactly turn your stomach. After all, you're not hired to protect this Jolie from yourself. So you have a late dinner, go to your place, shine up like a freshman going to his first prom, and then you drive to the Phoenix Hotel. You stand before the door of Laura Fenton's apartment, make a final tie adjustment, and ring the bell. Have we here? Uh, this is no French dish grinning at you from the doorway. This is Captain Pat Chambers, and it wouldn't take more than a crepe Suzette to knock you over. Come on in, Mike. What are you doing here, Pat? Well, I was about to ask you that very same question. Quite a coincidence, huh? All right, don't be comical. I'm here on... Business, I know. Laura Fenton is your client. But she happens to be. Tell me more, Mike. All right, where is she? We made a date for ten tonight. Somebody beat you to it. Who? Never mind. You were about to ask me that very same question. Maybe I was. Mm. So I'm stood up, am I? Yeah, but not in the usual way. Meaning? Meaning look in the bedroom and find out. Only don't touch anything, especially the knife. We'll want that for fingerprints. So you walk in the bedroom alone and look. And you find out, all right. Laura Fenton is sprawled face down across the bed. And the knife Pat Chambers was talking about is buried in the left side of her back. You walk up close and you find out something else. You're not alone in the room, huh? It's a dark, all right. Big and as angry sounding as a losing football coach between the halves. At first, you figure he's going for you, but when you back off, he just stands there growling. Dogs you can do without. And besides, you've seen all the nastiness you had to. Okay, Pat, I've had the 50 cent to her. What happened? I've already told you. Somebody beat you to your date. That's all I noticed. Look, Pat, this isn't so good for the home team. This afternoon, Laura Fenton walks in on me as alive as dynamo wire. Tonight, she's a dead corpse. Give me the run down, huh? Much as I can. Call came into my office around nine. The room clerk here. Somebody in the hotel complained about a dog barking. On investigation, they found her. By 9.45, I talked myself sick and come up with nothing. You walked in at ten. Now, you know as much as I do. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you know more. Well, now, look what I hold out on you, Pat. You don't want me to answer that, do you? No, not this time, but I'm not. Why should this time be different? It is. Take my word. Uh, you got a cigarette? Sure. Hey, thanks. She came to your office this afternoon. Around five. Why? Now, that's a silly question. Why does anyone? She figured someone was out to get her. Not her. Some doll who just came over from Paris. Oh, she wants you to look out for this doll. Yeah, that's right. From now until Monday morning. You gonna do it? If I can find her, yeah. I get paid for a job, I do a job. Mike. Yeah? Maybe I can help you. Laura Fenton didn't happen to mention the French doll's name, did she? Yeah, she did. Uh, the name's Jolie. What? Jolie. She didn't give it a rest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's so funny? French doll. Jolie. Oh, this is terrific. Is it? Absolutely terrific, Mike. Uh, you should I can, I can help you find her, all right. The room clerk told me who she was. Who? We already met her. What? Inside, Mike. Huh? The poodle in the... <laughs> Just come over from France, and her name is Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to That 
Hammer Guy. the young lady from Paris, and it turns out she's a fresh fool. Won several beauty contests on the continent. Uh, very funny, Pat. Very, very funny. Doesn't speak a word of English. Are you positively fine, <laughs> Freddie, Lieutenant? I haven't had so much fun since, since <laughs> dear old Grandma <laughs> broke her leg. Why, Mike, how could you be so bitter? <laughs> yeah, the laugh's on you, all right. But like you told Pat, somebody pays for a job, you follow through no matter how embarrassing. So you clip the leash on and slink back across town to your place. Uh, pickles and milk go better together than you and a French poodle with a ribbon in its head. On the way up in the elevator, the nightman starts to make a crack but has a fast change of mind when he spots the black scowl you're wearing. And no sooner do the both of you get into your apartment when Jolie pulls a fog. <laughs> All right, now look, fancy pants. Don't start beeping. Here, life isn't all champagne. I believe the animal is referring to me. But I'll be to introduce myself to Baldwin's name, Latimer Baldwin. Nice girl, easy girl. Let you get in here. Now, that's a good dog. How did I get in? <laughs> Simple, sir. Open the door and walked in. But it was open, was it not, Mr. Hammer? You should be more careful, sir. Other visitors might not be quite as gentle as myself. <laughs> oh, so your name's Latimer Baldwin. You wish sir, to know more about me. I wish. I, Mr. Hammer, am a fancier. Fancier than what? That's a joke, I take it. I'm a fancier of canines, and both a breeder and a trainer. Okay, so you've gone to the dog. <laughs> Definitely. Shall we sit down, Mr. Hammer? The sooner we settle our business, the sooner you can be alone with Jolie. Oh, you know this much name? Know it. Of course, Mr. Hammer, that's why I'm here. Will you have one of these, sir? Turkish blend. Very mine. Never mind cigarettes. What's why you're here? <laughs> Mr. Hammer, I see you're a devoted man. I like that. You do. I really do, sir. A man devoted to his work can be trusted. Now listen, Baldwin. All right, sir. Why I'm here, you say? The animals. Why I'm here. The dog, Jolie, and her most attractive mistress, Laura Fenton. God rest her soul. God rest her soul. <laughs> devoted, sir. And suspicious. I like that, too. Oh, you know Laura's dead. I do that. Dead, murdered, a knife protruding from her lovely supple body. You see, I am devoted, too, Mr. Hammer. Keep talking. You're right, sir, and I will. We'll attack the very heart of the matter. The deceased told me to come to you on one condition. That condition being the event of her death. Go on. Should that event take place before Monday morning, I wish to present you with your instructions. Instructions? Precisely the word Miss Fenton used. You're sure you won't smoke? Yeah, I'm sure. Too bad. A really very mild blend. Well, Mr. Hammer, I put this to you man to man. Miss Fenton presented you with a sum of money. One thousand dollars, I believe. Are we together so far? You're carrying the ball. <laughs> Indeed I am. Very neatly put, Mr. Hammer. Oh, please, applause turns my head. And for the sum of money, you were to take care of this young lady from tonight until Monday morning. Are we together? We're together. <laughs> In fact, Baldwin, I'm a lap ahead of you right now. Oh? 
Yeah, if you're here to see whether or not I ducked out on the job, you're wasting your time. When I'm paid for my services, I follow through. Corpses or not. <laughs> you're an honorable man, sir. No one would deny it. But I'm not here in the capacity you mentioned. No, indeed. What capacity? I'm here, Mr. Hammer, simply to see that you follow out your instructions. And those are that you show Jolie personally. Show Jolie? Show it at home. To whom, sir? Why, to the judges, of course. Miss Fenton didn't tell you? Tell me what? My dear Mr. Hammer, this French poodle is a prized possession. Already she has won over 20 blue ribbons in Europe. Now she's entered in the annual dog show Monday at the garden. She's what? Entered in the best of all breeds class, sir. And you, Mr. Hammer, have now the signal honor of showing her... <laughs> The dog laughs still on you, but you're not going to take it lying down in the manger. This, uh, Latimore Baldwin character starts for the gate, but you're not letting him out of the kennel till you growl out a few opinions of your own. But try to understand, Mr. Hammer. It is imperative that you show Jolie. Uh, you understand. I'm not making a monkey out of myself at any dog show. I'll be there, I assure you, as a mentor to lend a hand to guide you. Uh, you'll be there, pal, but I won't. Sir, I quote your own words. When I'm paid for my services, I follow through. Your very own words. Okay, but I'm not eating them right now. I must be on my way. Now listen, you. Your phone, Mr. Hammer. I'm not going to... Good night, sir. I'll be seeing you the show. <laughs> Definitely. Now, Baldwin. I... Oh. Yeah. This is Monsieur Hammer. That is. It is urgent, monsieur, that I see you immediately. Laura Fenton asked me to call. That's so? Oui. Well, for your information, sweetheart, Laura Fenton is dead. I know this. That's why I must see you right away. My life, it is in danger now. Oh, you don't say. It is no joking, madam, monsieur. Do you know where Bedford Street is? What if I do? I am at the number 205 Bedford. Can you be in here in half of an hour? I'll be in bed in half of an hour unless you tell me who this is. Oh, I'm so sorry. It is only that I have been so... Or how you say, upset. My name, Monsieur Hammer, is Jolie. Well, not only are you unhappy about one Jolie, now it turns out there are two. Well, you parked the canine one with the super down in the basement, and then you scoot over to Bedford Street. When you jab the doorbell at number 205, you're ready for about anything. Monsieur Hammer. Hmm. You're Jolie. Oui. Come in, please. May I take your hand? You won't be staying that long. Oh, I was hoping you would. See, I have everything prepared. Hmm? For a little bite. The sandwiches and coffee on the table over there. Oh. Nice place. I am so glad you approve. And I am so glad you arrived. Yeah? May we? If we are going to be in business together, we would be well acquainted. Is it not so? Oh, we're going in business together, huh? You're, uh, how do you say, out to do business, are you not, monsieur? Sit down, please. Some coffee? Is that the best you have to offer? It is at this minute. All right, I'll take some. Sugar? Anything but poison. Would I poison you? Would you? You make the joke with me. Now, what are you making with me, besides time? Your coffee, monsieur. I changed my mind. Uh, tell me, Jolie, uh, just how much did you plan for us to get acquainted? Oh, I do not know, monsieur. I like to allow things to go their own way, don't you? You won't change your mind again about the process? Not tonight. Well, this is, um... Uh, how you say... You say cozy. We. Oui. Oui. Or maybe just a little too cozy. Eh? Of course, the variation is interesting. Coffee instead of liquor. All right, sister, what do you want? Pardon. Come on, all this set up, everything so, how you say, cozy. What do you want? What's the bottom line? I don't believe I follow, monsieur. Oh, sure you do. You follow just fine. In the first place, your name's not Jolie. In the second place, your accent is as phony as a ward heel has promised. And in the third place, you and I could get a lot better acquainted if that clown in the next room would keep his nose out of the door. <laughs> I liked you right away, Mr. Hammer. I think you got brains. I have about dames like you. No guy's got brains about women. Okay, Carlos, come on in. Yes, I come. Shake hands with Carlos Rivera, Mr. Hammer. Uh, and the accent's no phony. No phony, I assure you, Mr. Hammer. Okay, no phony. Now, how about the pitch? You have something Carlos and I want, and we're willing to pay well for it. See, very well. Maybe not well enough. Well, there's no sense bargaining. 
I'll give you our top figure right away. It's 25000 25000 you say? Huh? That's right, and that's top. Is it a deal, senor? It might be if I knew what you wanted. Senor Hammond. Oh, wait, Carla. You've no idea what we're talking about, I suppose? None. We're talking about the package Laura Fenton gave you in your office today. Oh, that. Give us that package, and you'll have 25000 Sorry, no God. You must have it. The package wasn't in Laura's apartment. Having killed her, you know that. You said it, not us. Well, no matter who said it or who has the package, you're both wasting your time. Mr. Hammer, we're trying to do this the pleasant way. Don't push us. Who's pushing? You won't give us the package? You couldn't pay my price even if I did have it. Carlos? See? Mr. Hammer is having trouble with his memory. Help him. Oh, I wouldn't try, Carlos, believe me. Knives don't go so easy into my bag, so you'd better not <laughs> thought. You zigged Carlos when you should have zagged the dame. You had it right smack in the back of the skull. You wake up screaming. Your head is swimming around like a fish in a ball, and your face feels as wet. Something soft, moist, and mushy is making slobbery laps against your cheek. It turns out to be Joey. That French poodle is making a St. Bernard grandstand play for a very amused audience. <laughs> Man's best friend is his poodle. Uh, never stop having fun, do you, Fat? Well, maybe it'll be even funnier when you give me the details. Um, did you bring me back to my apartment here for this priceless repartee? I found you here. Huh? Got a call from the super. He saw a guy lamb it out of here. Get him? No, but the question now is, does the guy get what he came for? What do you mean? Well, take a look around. Nice mishmash. What was he looking for? How should I know? Look, Mike, I'm warning you. No holding back I've got no client to protect. She's dead, so why should I hold back? All I know is, is that for a package. Which had in it? I don't know. Mike? Where, Pat? But I do know it was worth offering me 25,000 bucks for it. And that's all you do know? Oh, except for the woman. Now it comes. What woman? The one who was with the guy who shut this place down. Super said he was alone. Come on, what about the dame? There's nothing more I can tell you, Pat, honest. Then who can? Maybe she can herself. So you take Pat Chambers back to 205 Bedford Street. If you're good and lucky, you figure you'll get both Carlos and the dame. But you only get the dame. And even that isn't lucky. Because the dame is dead. In just a moment, we'll return to that hammer guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery that hammer guy. Just in the same couch where you sat next to me. And the gape of terrible shock on her face tells you that her last living moment was the worst surprise of her life. When Pat turns her over, the handle of the blade points like the finger of death. Same kind of knife that killed Laura Fenton. Mm -hmm. In the same spot. What did you say this guy's name was? She called him Carlos Rivera. And Rivera's our boy, all right. Had a falling out with his partner. Figure? Figure. But over what? Could be anything from diamonds to gold. Uh, you're figuring way ahead of me, Pat. Diamonds or gold, if this dame was running through to form. Well, you know who she is. Never forget a face I see on a bulletin board. Her name's Rita Shearer. She's wanted on a smuggling rap. So her partner got her first. He can have her now. Well, Mike, there's nothing else you can do. Oh, I don't know. And what's that supposed to mean? That show at the garden Monday. What about it? I'm going to be there, Pat, to uh, see a dog about a killer. <laughs> So Monday, you and Jolie turn up at the garden and meet Latimer Baldwin. For a couple of hours, you don't go upstairs to the floor where the four-legged eyebrows put on the dog. You stay downstairs in the basement where the kennels are. Downstairs, the place is all the sound effects of a deceptive cat's nightmare. It really isn't too bad, Mr. Hammer, once you're used to it. Once I get used to it. Once you walk out on that floor upstairs, a great change will come over you. Now, look, Baldwin, I'm no dog lover, believe me. You'll become one. And you'll be very proud of Jolie when she wins. Pretty sure she's going to win, huh? Can't lose her. She is clown. Tell me just one thing. Why do they trim her that way with those crazy pom-poms? With passion, sir. Uh, I'll bet the dog doesn't approve. <laughs> I see you're becoming sentimental over her already. Uh-uh. Just embarrassed for her. It'll be different upstairs. Wait and see. I'll be watching you from the stand. And I guarantee you, sir, 
You'll be as proud as a peacock. I don't think you'll be watching me, Baldwin. I beg your pardon? What were you doing before? Before? When you uh, sent me upstairs to find the papers for Jolie's entrance. I? Why, you know perfectly well. I took her for a stroll. Yeah, but why? Why? Well, because she was skittish. You could see that. I could see you were, too, Baldwin. But you were much easier when you brought her back, weren't you? Sure, I failed to follow you. Yeah, but I didn't fail to follow you when you went for that walk. Huh? And I saw you changed the dog's collar, too. And what she's wearing now is worth only a couple of bucks, but the what, what about the one you took off? How much was that worth, Baldwin? Fifty thousand? Hundred? More? Mr. Hammer, you're a gentleman of discernment. Baldwin, you're a stinking killer. But that shouldn't preclude us from coming to an understanding. Like what? The diamonds in the car are worth in the neighborhood of two hundred thousand. I'm sure we can make some satisfactory arrangements. Uh, what about Carlos? Where does he come in? He went out. His body will never be found. Took care of all three of your friends, didn't you? Necessary, you know. No, I didn't, no. They weren't friends at all. They all wanted to cheat me out of my share. Well, Mr. Hammer, what do you say to a very generous offer on my part? Uh, I'd like to accept, but uh, what will surely think of me? The alternative, then, is? Very nasty for you. Perhaps not. I can't think of any other alternative. Does this stimulate your thinking, sir? Are you trying to kid, Baldwin? You wouldn't use that here. I'm not kidding in the slightest, sir. The shots will turn this place into an even matter bedlam. My escape under such conditions will not be too difficult. I really think you're going to try it, huh? No doubt about it, sir. I'm going to try it right here in... It's Jolie thinking of Curly Steve in the Baldwin's leg. You grab his gun fast and then swat him with it across the jaw. Baldwin goes down like a sack of dog wheat. Pat Chambers comes in through the crowd. He looks down at Baldwin while you give the Legion of Honor embrace to one of France's greatest heroines. You were right, Mike. What, am I ever wrong? Ah, it's a nice girl. Tonight it's steak for dinner. Nice, nice girl. So all of a sudden you're a dog lover. Now look, Pat, this happens to be the girl of my dream. All right, all right. Come on down to the office, make out your report, and then you two can be alone. Uh, you'll have to wait for the report, Pat. Why? Well, uh, Jolie and I have a date upstairs on the floor. And... Pal, are we going to show him? So you show him, all right. Jolie struts around the judging ring as proud as a Republican last election day. And you? Well, you're not exactly heavy-footed yourself. Baldwin was right about one thing. The big change has come over you. Yep. That little hound has more savoir faire in her than ten queens. And when the judge hands you the blue ribbon, you look down at Jolie and you think, oh, yes, sir. There certainly is something about a dame. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, an unexpected amount of humor for a Mike Hammer story, and I guess it does go back to what I said in the first episode on how these programs often were reformatted from what you might see. Uh, read in a book or see in a movie to fit the expectations of radio. I will say, despite the big deal they made about it at the end, Mike Hammer liking dogs or caring about dogs never comes up in any of the other episodes that I've listened to. So it's probably a lesser change than one might expect given the big deal they made about it in the episode. All right, well, uh, listener comments and feedback now. Regarding Pat Novak, Christy writes in, I tried listening to the show earlier, and it's just not for me. Jack Webb doesn't do it for me. But I listened to this early San Francisco episode and enjoyed the rapid-fire conversations the characters had. Also, how he described the second girl. Well, thank you so much, uh, Christy. Do appreciate your comment, and I'm glad you liked that episode. And who knows, we may find uh, more episodes from that San Francisco run one of these days. All right, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Richard Diamond. 
And next Tuesday, another episode of That Hammer Guy. In the meantime, send your comments to books13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of